Um, yeah, this is me. So I'm Christian Karl. I'm from Sweden, Stockholm. Uh, I work for a company called Spotify. I haven't done that all my life. Um, I started programming in 83, uh, Fortran. Uh, so I am as old as I look, yes. Now, the only thing interesting here in this uh, bullet list is actually the second last one, founded graphwalker.org. It's an open source project uh, for model-based testing, and this is what I'm going to talk about. Not so much about the tool, but rather about the technology or the methodology. Now, I'm a bit curious about the crowd here. Who have in this room ever done model-based testing? Hands up. Actually, a couple of hands. <laughs> that is great. Uh, so, this technology is, uh, so, Spotify. This is Spotify. It's a music streaming uh, business, and I'm not going to talk more about Spotify than this. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how to work in Spotify tomorrow in a completely different session. So, away. Um, Model-based testing is a fairly new thing uh, on, uh, in the software testing scene. You can probably find this guy, uh, Harry Robinson, is the one who made me discover model-based testing in 2004. And uh, this is sort of a living proof of why it's good to go to conferences because I went to a conference in the US, the Star East, which is a huge conference, not as big as this one, but it's only about testing. And I went to a workshop and I've never heard about model-based testing. I think I went there by pure chance and I listened to this guy and he sort of had all the answers to the problems I have encountered when I did test automation over the 10 past years or previous years. Uh, and that was in 2004, and the first Wiki article happens also to be in 2004, which is sort of interesting. But I'm sure that model-based testing has been around earlier than that. Now, when I came back from that conference, I wanted to do uh, model-based testing, but there weren't any tools. There were commercial tools, super, super expensive, and they were more targeted to uh, embedded development and software systems like uh, um, real-time systems and mobiles and telephone switches and such. I wanted to do model-based testing for the Swedish National Police Board where they had sort of investigation systems with lots of workflow which made sense for me to use model-based testing. So I created or I, found, I started an open source project called graphwalker.org in order, in order to do that. So what is model-based testing? There were a few hands, but for the rest of you, um, first of all, models. Now, what we model in model-based testing is not the system itself. We try to uh, describe the expected behavior of a system on the test, which is sort of a different thing. For a tester, uh, we want to test behaviors, what we expect that a system should do. When you make a model, uh, it might look like the system, but it's not the system. And this is pretty convenient because models, by definition, are an abstraction of the complex real world. We as testers, when we design our tests, we make sort of, we, we reduce the re reality into something much more simpler. Because the first thing that we acknowledge as testers is that we can't test everything. So what to de-scope, what to leave out, and what to keep. So models, suits, it's a fit in that picture. Now the models I'm talking about is state machines, or uh, state charts, or state diagrams. But what it is, it's a couple of states and their relationships. That's what it is. And from these models, when we have created them, we let a tool, and this is exactly what GraphWalker does, it will create tests for you automatically. So the only thing you as a tester need to worry about are the models. 
let, you give, let me give you an example of what a model can be like. So we need a state. Now, in this case, I have a state where something is not authenticated. And I can verify that. Uh, perhaps I'm a user, so I can look up in the database and ask, is this user authenticated? Or I can look in the browser cache and see if there's something or store credentials for this specific user there. So I can in some way verify it. Now, if I verify to, if, if it passes the verification, then it's okay. Then I can continue with the next step, which is perhaps this. Try to log in using valid credential. Now, this is a transition. Now, the expected behavior that I as a tester would expect is this. I'm authenticated. And again, I can do pretty much the same thing as in the first state, but in this case, I'm expecting that the outcome would be that, yes, this user is now authenticated. Now, this is a model, and this is a state chart. Model can be much more than state charts, but I'm only talking about state charts here. So this is a model. This is it. This is your test design. And from this, you generate test cases and let code like Appium, for instance, or Selenium, or whatnot, depending on your system under test, run the tests. Now, this is a super simple model, of course, for demonstration purposes. So, uh, in graph theory, we call these the states for vertex or vertices. That's just graph theory. And the transitions are called edges or edge. Now, uh, let's move on to a more real example, but it's still not real. Um, the Spring project has a really cool demonstration project, an example project, which you can run offline. So if you ever want to test Selenium on an offline project that you don't need to be connected to the world, run the, the pet clinic. Uh, you just start it as a Maven project and it will download all, all the dependencies and launch on your computer and you will have this uh, great website which you can use for testing purposes. Okay? This is what you will see. Now this is the home page for this demonstration example project and if I were to model it using model-based testing, this is what it could look like. Now this is a state chart and it shows what I can do from this page. There is a start node. And it points to a state, a vertex called the home page. It means that I want to verify that I'm actually in the home page. But this home page has links, and it will take me to another page, which is called find owners, and there's another one, veterinarians. And then I can jump around like that. I can probably do lots, lots more than that, but that's how I decided this case. Now, from a testing perspective, it's pretty obvious what this test will do, right? Because it's visual. Anyone can see what it's doing, which is important. Now, moving on, we have another view on this website, and I can use a model that uh, will test this view like that. I can do a search and I will verify that I get a search list and see if it's correct. Uh, I can add an owner and then I, I expect to come to another view that will verify that. This is a list of veterinarians and I can search that as well, a real small model. And if I s create a new owner, I can either give incorrect data or I can give correct data, and this is what I would expect. Now, these are very simple, small models, and if you want to do it a bit more complicated, uh, for owner information, you can add pets, and you can add uh, visits to the veterinarian, and maybe the model will look like this. Right? So this model shows me how I can walk around in the graph. Now, this model is only for this page, sort of. Now, these are all individual models, right? And it's, they are small, and they're small for a purpose. And the purpose is to keep the model small because the maintenance and the work will be so much easier with, with the individual models. If you have a super huge model, it will be much harder to maintain. And it's, it will be harder equally for people to understand what you're doing. And that's really important. Now, these models 
interact with each other. Um, for instance, we have something, we have keywords, and shared here is the keyword. So we have shared find owners, and that vertex up there has the same keyword, shared find owners. It means that when GraphWalker tries to generate test cases, which is sort of a path, that is sort of the test cases. It understands that when I'm at that vertex over to the left, I might be able, I can jump over to that model if I want. So this is how we get a large model out of several small. And connecting all these shared keywords together, the blue edges here represents sort of virtual edges that GraphWalker creates runtime. So actually the model is this complicated. Okay? Let me go back. I want to show you a demo of how it actually can look like. Now, when I talk about this, people sort of sit and, mm, mm, okay. But when I show this demo, usually people go, ah. And let me see if I can. So what are we seeing here? This is the system under test. This is GraphWalker running Java and Selenium in order to interact with the system under test. It also has a WebSocket API, which this JavaScript hooks into and visualizes what's actually going on. Now, this test generation that I was talking about is executed or generated runtime. So I don't, depending on which parameters and options I give GraphWalker, I can't really tell which permutations are going to be executed during this test. Which is good, because uh, I will get a better test coverage, sort of. It's bad, because if I put it in a continuous integration system or a continuous delivery, I can't expect the tests to take too long time. That's why we would love to have the Chinese Postman algorithm implemented, which is sort of calculates the shortest possible path through the whole system. We had that before, but we haven't implemented that really in the, in the third version. But this is really what happens. The models that we saw there before, the blue means uh, we haven't visited those edges and vertices yet. We are, we are waiting for them to be executed. And this is shows to the right uh, what we're actually doing in the system under test. Now, did I hear a, ah, <laughs> right? <laughs> so this is actually what GraphWalker does. It generates tests from the models and then lets some other tool actually do the execution. So when I interact, interact with a website, I, let, I choose the web driver from Selenium, of course. Why wouldn't I? Right? So GraphWalker hasn't so much to do with the, with the actual, you know, interaction with the system on the test. It's more of the planning. Now, <clears throat> where can we use model-based testing? So, I need to go to myself and see what I have done with model-based testing. UI, of course, I mean, it was an example that we saw, right? So anything with a UI, it means inherently that there's a user there, and when there's a user there, there's some sort of workflow involved, a use case. As a user, I want to do this or that. And maybe I go there, and maybe there's an alternative workflow uh, uh, lying there somewhere. So models are really good to do that. Uh, at Spotify, we use it to test our payment systems. We have, di we have different flows, cr different credit cards, different ways of handle payments, so the models are really good for that. By the way, that team decided that, nah, we don't like Java, we like Python. So they ported uh, the Java GraphWalker into Python, which is uh, also open source and on, on uh, Spotify's GitHub account. So there's a Python implementation of GraphWalker. 
accidentally there's I think there's a C sharp port coming up from a gaming company in Denmark called Unity. They have a really cool implementation of that. Advertising, we've done a lot of testing for advertising. Because ads are really complicated, they should only show up under special circumstances. And if you use written language to try to describe what is going to happen, it will be really hard for anybody to understand how to write the code to implement that. Models have a tendency to make people go like, yeah, I understand exactly what's happening. But this edge shouldn't go there, it should go there. So it's been really good for, for the design phase. Any kind of workflow system, REST APIs, and we tested it on all different kind of platforms. It doesn't really matter what the system under test, where it's running at. That is sort of more tool dependent when we do the impl uh, implementation. But why would we even do, why couldn't we just use BDD for instance, right? Or anything else. Now, <clears throat> The motivation to use model-based testing, which made me go, ah, when I listened to Harry Robinson in 2004, was that, let's do this in order. It's collaborative. Now, this might not so sound that impressive, but for instance, at Spotify, where we are really agile, we say, but we, mm, we are. It's all about a team effort work. Now, the testers, the test automators, they don't sit in a corner like second class citizens somewhere when they're doing their testing. They're sitting with the team. And the whole team needs to understand what they're doing. Especially they need to know what the tests are all about. Having a collaborative way of, of uh, showing what we're doing, like visual models, has been really, really helpful. It also does exactly what BDD does. We separate the test design from the implementation in code. For maintenance purposes, this is super, super important. If I, as a tester, who really don't... I, I know how to program Java, but I'm not a developer. If I need to read Java code to, re, um, to understand what the test is doing, make changes because we had development in the system under test and then re-implement that code back in. It's, it's a sort of a, um, it, it doesn't help me. If I instead just could change the test using the model and then just regenerate the tests. For me as a tester, that is really awesome because it means literally that you can involve people who, know, who doesn't know how to program. They just draw the models in some tool. We use YED, which is not open source, but it's closed, uh, it's, it's freeware, so anyone can use it. And it runs on Java, so it runs on anything, really. And it's really, really a good tool. And, uh, but it means that the product owner, who sort of, uh, we had really good experience of product owners actually doing the tests and giving that to the team, and then the team implemented the, the test, which is sort of interesting. They never did that before. But really, the separation is all about maintenance. And if you do changes, we just regenerate the test cases automatically. And that is not unimportant. And all this leads to lower maintenance and higher uh, return of investment. Our, we have tests that we wrote four or five years ago, and they're still running. They have changed over the years, but the tests as such are still running. I've never encountered that before. I started using model-based testing. Tests always died after six months or one year. Now, how do you run these tests? Well, they are generated automatically, and you can do it two ways. You can either do it offline which means that the test, the sequence, are generated and uh, kept in a file somewhere. And then you use that file and you let your test read each line, line by line, and then execute that as method or function calls and iterates over that file. Now it means that you have a test that you can, uh, that is sort of static. The way we do it at Spotify is we use online, which means that the sequence is actually generated 
runtime. Uh, <clears throat> which is cool because we will get permutations uh, that will differ. It's not important for our test exactly how they run. It's little less, it's pretty much a real user. I want you to do, visit this page and try to do this, but the way you travel to that point doesn't really matter. Now the way online works is, and also offline in a sense, is that we can create different test types using the same models. <laughs> I'm still here using the same models and the same implementing code. It means that given uh, some runtime options to GraphWalker, we can run a smoke test. So even if we have this complex model, I tell Gra uh, GraphWalker, I want you to start there and go the shortest path to there and you're done. The golden path or something like that. Functional test. Then I would tell GraphWalker, I need you to cover all the edges. And that implicit means also running all vertices. And as soon as we have covered everything, you're done. That's sort of a functional test. Or if you're interested, you could do sort of a non-functional test where you say, run this model for three hours, or 10 hours, or whatever, and I will monitor for resource leakage. Uh, a 10 hour run will guarantee that you will have permutations that you have never done before, if you're interested. The backdrop with having exhaustive tests is that when you get a problem, how do you reproduce that? And that's sort of the same problems we have for real users. Then we don't rely as much on, you can have breadcrumbs, we know exactly how we came there, but it, if I am telling the developer, well, we have this one million steps that you need to do in order to get the problem, and he says, yeah, right, that doesn't really work. So we have to have the same mechanism and testability in our system under test as we have for real users, like proper, really good logs. That is what I tended to cover in this talk about model-based testing. So, and I have a slide with the references to the open source project and the code, if you want to look at that. There are some videos. Uh, the previous talker, uh, Dan, it was Dan, talked about documentation. We try to do documentation. I think we have fairly good documentation, but it's not, uh, it's not that hard to get started with it. I could, that's how not bad the documentation is. We have uh, uh, Google Groups, for discussion groups, where we try to answer, just as Dan described, all the questions that will pop up. Um, but sure, this is a really, really small community. Model-based testing is really, really special. It's the, the little kid in the class. Um, the problems that you would uh, get typically with, the, with GraphWalker is that, um, that if you have a system under test that is flaky, you would definitely get flaky test results because GraphWalker would expose most of those problems. Uh, in the beginning, there's a joke from our CTO when we created a dashboard that showed all the test results that we were that we were getting from uh, all the tests that we were running, model-based test-driven, it was mostly red. It should have been all green. And he was really upset and said, what's the purpose, what's the, uh, this, what's the use case for having uh, auto test automation when it fails? Mm, well, the automation didn't really fail, it actually just exposed the system under test. Uh, so it really needs a stable system and you should really run, if you want to do model-based testing, run it from the start of the development cycle. Questions? I'd be glad to answer questions at this point. Hi, thank you very much for this topic. I'm already working with model-based testing for a couple of years, and there is a great problem when you're uh, automating the really complex system, and the graph walker generates over 100,000 tests, and the duration of that run is over 20 years, or something like that. <laughs> How do you decrease this uh, count of the test to the efficient count 
like 2,000 tests to test the main business processes of the system. Yeah. So um, if you have this really, I mean, I guess you have a far, you have a, a great, a big model, I would guess. Now. Remember the first, I mean, you should only model what's really crucial to you, the business. So, I mean, you can model all the corner cases. And if you do a lot of sort of, yeah, it's like when I started doing model-based testing and I was exiting the app, so that was sort of an edge exit. And then I th thought, well, I can exit in many ways. I can do uh, in Windows Alt F4, I can do file exit, I can kill the process. and, and Really, I only needed one way. But if you, you need to, you need to think about how many things you really need in the model. Now, given that you have done that and you still have a big model, what do you do then? Now, GraphWalker generates path using generators, and it stops generating t uh, sequences according to stop conditions. Now, it's up for, to you to choose the right generator and the right stop conditions in order to control that. Okay, another question about uh, data-driven testing using the graph walker. Yeah. It is also a big problem when you have such a thing like you have vertex. Uh, you use some kind of set of the test data. Uh, you Work through the workflow of the business process, return to the uh, same vertex. The system generally already changed the state, mm -hmm. and this is a kind of that vertex, but it's really a sub vertex. So you can't use the same, the similar data to uh, go through the. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, the little model I had with authent not authenticated give authentic uh, credentials and then you authenticate it. Let's say that you have, you want to test different kind of accounts types and you have two accounts. Well, that could be two edges, right? But what if you have a thousand different account types? Oh, yeah, this is a problem. <laughs> it's a problem because it's impossible to draw. Well, it, it, it's not ergonomically nice to have thousand edges. So what you can do is that you, you take the data and you, 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 you keep that in the implementation and the code. You probably have an array, uh, you can use the data provider from, from JUnit or something like that, and you can signal from the code up to the model when, when it's done over an iteration where you log in, log out, log in, log out, and if you fulfill a condition, you can exit. That's, you have this way of communication back to the model, so the model would know when to stop. You have that opportunity. I can show you, we can talk afterwards, I can show you how it's done. And a little last question. Uh, how do you create the logs for these uh, test runs? Okay, GraphWalker will always generate logs which path it has, has chosen. But uh, we decorate our methods with a lot of log and uh, logs ourselves when we do execute the tests. If we test mobile, we have, we have annotation that will automatically always take a screenshot when we enter and exit the method. Uh, so it's both in GraphWalker, but it, we more rely upon the system on the test to do, to do that. Sorry, not the system on the test, the, the implementation of the code. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question, I'm not a QA or anything, but I kind of, it's very interesting. I, can we keep the history? Where are you? Hmm? Where is yeah. it? Oh, there. There. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> climb the share, but I better not. Um, so, can we keep a history of all our tests over time? So, I always can go back and see a certain, like, kind of basically what is your path in your system. I, I always know that type of test was successful over the last year. And what I can also see is that test now got slower and slower over time, for example. Mm -hmm. So, I can have a lot of analytics behind the tests. And I wonder how that works in your cases, because what I imagine is what I would have to do is I have to create something like UUIDs for a path or subpath even um, to, to keep the history of the data, which is very valuable. Are you meaning when we log during execution and how we... So, I mean, when it comes to slower and slower execution, we only look, we can't look over segments of uh, I mean, um, edge, vertex, edge, vertex. We only look at one edge, one 
and uh, one vertex and we log those individuals. Those individuals we can see during time if they are going slower and slower. But for a sequence, we don't really look at that. Okay, but like kind of one edge, one vertex, an edge is already good. Um, following up on that, it kind of, kind of you describe the case with like, m like the login case is uh, a thousand account types, right? Yeah. That's a very real problem for most customers in the end. Um, can you put weight on edges so that your s test suit kind of regularly takes the most common case? You yes, you can. You, you can add probabilities. So it okay. means that it will be a 10%. So you have three out edges from a state. Mm -hmm. And you want one single edge to be 90% yeah. chosen. You can do that. That is cool. And what do you kind of do we keep track of tests that are not run anymore? So I assume that if you run your test suit again and again and it's yeah. created live, do you have some like escalation metrics if suddenly you have 10% less tests or something like that? So that's more an implementation of uh, how we handle test results. Uh, so we have an internal data result index, a huge database where, which uh, ingests all the results. And there we you know, know th have that information. We know what to expect and we can query that index and it will say yay or nay. Or it will be happy or it will be sad. So that's not so much about GraphWalker, that's more the tools around it, yeah.